Well, wearing a poppy is an individual choice, but it is an important symbol that reflects initially the fields where the fighting took place in World War I, and then, of course, it was adopted more internationally in the 1920s and beyond. And it's a reflection at that moment of the year when we pause, we reflect, we remember the conflicts, the world wars, those who were lost, those who were deeply affected. In fact, you can argue quite persuasively that most families in Britain have been touched by both world wars. We remember this year in particular the Somme, the, the, the effect of that campaign. I was present, fortunate, privileged to be present in Manchester Cathedral, a very moving ceremony, whilst Her Majesty the Queen and other members of the royal family were at Tipval. I was also privileged to be present in the Orkneys, uh, where we remembered the naval campaign 100 years ago. The thing that struck me in both of those events isn't just the, the poppy as a symbol of remembrance, but also the reconciliation that is now evident between the warring factions, between the warring nations. And of course, we saw that last year with the commemoration of 100 years of Gallipoli. So remembering is a very powerful part of our culture. And it is important that through, as we enter 2017, we remember that in 1917, the effect of war was so strong that already the British government decided to create the Imperial War Museum and the first war exhibition there is, is world class and of course the Commonwealth War Graves Commission so that would be a permanent record of British soldiers where they fell. And where do you stand on, and it is a debate, on the, on the, the founder of the, the Poppy Fund? Of course, Earl Haig, his statue stands prominently in the centre of Whitehall right outside this, this building. I, I mean, do you subscribe to the he was one of the donkeys leading the lions or was he in an age of industrial warfare there was no other option? Well, I think often and I'm, I'm told I'm not an author myself that the, one of the, the things that people do towards the end of writing their book is choose the title and that is indeed a catchy title I don't think it's fair on either Field Marshal Lord Haig or um, many of the leaders on any side of the First World War it was a tremendous war of steel, of modern technology, of, the, of, of technologies that emerged as a spurt created through the war, such as aeroplanes, submarines. So I think it's true to say that commanders in the field in 1914 could not have predicted the conditions in the field by 1918. And uh, Lord Haig, Hill Haig, saw many of those conditions reveal themselves in his own command. In fact, he was quite a supporter of new technology during the war, and I do think it's unfair to, to just go for the one-line version of, of leadership in a time of war. That he was throwing soldiers' lives away willfully. I think there has been a revision in the, in the serious history, certainly in my lifetime, and I'm, I'm sure there'll be more uh, scholarship to come. Uh, and There doesn't seem to be a shortage of material from various archives. Now, tell me more about uh, poppy wearing. Bring it right up uh, to, to, to this weekend. Uh, were you pleased that the Football Association stood up to, to FIFA during the England-Scotland <laughs> game? Well, of course, the, the wearing of a poppy is an individual decision. And certainly that's the same for members of the armed forces, although most of us tend to wear them. Um, we're respecting not just those who fell, but also those who served today. And many of those who served today support football. Uh, as they did during the war. And to answer the question obliquely, I think what's striking is how many sportsmen served during the First World War. Uh, in fact, one, I know a rugby league player who uh, was a professional rugby league player during the war who won the Victoria Cross. And so that sense of the link between the armed forces and sport on the, on the battlefield and on the playing field is a very strong link and the, the, the decision resonates with many members of the armed forces. Now, let's uh, talk about uh, other issues, and uh, a lot on your plate. I just returned from the United States where mm -hmm. we witnessed that extraordinary result, the election mm -hmm. of Donald Trump to become the next president, the 45th president. Is the world now a more dangerous place, in your view, as a result? Not at all. I mean, we, obviously, the Prime Minister, is for the Prime Minister, not for the Chief of Defence Staff, to send congratulations to Mr Trump on his election. I mean, my point is very simple, that we have a very wide and a very deep relationship with the United States through the armed forces, with the armed forces. We serve with our 
American friends in a number of parts of the world. We have served with them for many years. Again, I refer back to the First World War. 2017, we'll be remembering 100 years since the United States entered the First World War. So the military links between our two nations are strong. They're very, very broadly based, and they will continue to be so. And Mr. Trump's election is just another moment in, in United States history. What do you think, though, having served yourself, of course, with NATO forces and those links with the United States through NATO, what Mr. Trump's said about that, that uh, he's effectively saying that some countries are not pulling their weight, they're not spending enough, and that he won't necessarily, as president, abide by Article 5, the, the one for all, all for one clause, that if you're attacked, we protect you? Well, NATO is a very durable and enduring institution. In almost 70 years old. Very few security organizations in history have lasted that long. And NATO itself has evolved since the Cold War, during the Cold War and since the Cold War. NATO, of course, is a collective security organization. And in that role, it's very important that we honor that commitment. And I have every confidence that that commitment will be honored should that be necessary. What we are doing in NATO now, and it's important to remember for the viewers, that the UK remains a very important leading member of NATO, is supporting the Alliance commanders. You asked me earlier on about Earl Haig. I was talking to Saka, Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, yesterday, in projecting stability, which is part of NATO's role to provide selective, collective security in Europe. But do you go along with President-elect Trump's view that other NATO members, including Britain, must keep up this level of defence spending, and some of them must spend more? Britain spends 2% of gross domestic product, which is the NATO requirement, one of the four nations to do so. And it's something like, depending on the exchange rate, $60 billion a year. We are the second largest NATO uh, defence spending member, the largest in the European Union. So the UK is doing its bit. More importantly, in many ways, is the, is the reputation of the UK to support both the alliance in leadership positions across the Alliance headquarters structure, and also our forces commitment to NATO operations. Secretary of State for Defence, Sir Michael Fallon, announced recently that we will commit to Southern Air Policing next year. We'll send um, an armoured battle group into Estonia as part of the Supreme Allied Command of Europe's enhanced forward presence operation. And so we remain very active with maritime, land forces and air forces in support of the Alliance as the cornerstone of our security. And you mentioned Estonia there. I mean, do you see President Putin and the Baltic situation as one of the, the biggest threats ahead? Well, the, 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 I wouldn't use the word threat. I would use the word strategic competition. And it's important that when I say the mission is called enhanced forward presence, that's what it means. It means as part of collective security, we're projecting stability up to and including the borders of NATO. We have chosen with other leading nations to go to Estonia as part of a, um, a commitment to the Baltic states. Equally, we're sending our typhoons to Romania as part of our commitment to southern air policing. Have we got the resources anymore, though? We have got the resources. Following the Strategic Defence Security Review last year, we have got the resources. One of the critical parts of my job is to balance those commitments with those resources. And lastly, about Syria, and again, I suppose this, this flows from President-elect Trump. He said some contradictory things, I guess, about Syria and, and Russia's role in it, but one of them might be cooperating with the Russians and indeed with Syrian forces uh, to deal with Islamic State. Could you see Britain collaborating in that kind of a venture? Well, the, the situation in Syria has evolved. Um, this time last year, the idea of Russian intervention was brand new. It had just happened. We've seen in the, in the last calendar year how Russia's engagement in Syria has grown, both in terms of the, the terrible situation in around Aleppo and elsewhere in Syria. Our own commitment to the 67-nation coalition is very real. Uh, forces are active uh, both in Iraq and in Syria, as agreed by Parliament. And that coalition continues to deny Daesh the space it needs. It has created as a so-called caliphate to operate. It is losing ground everywhere. Now, of course, Russia's role has been largely in support of the Syrian regime, and we would absolutely condemn Russia's ability or Russia's forces 
making the situation on the ground in Syria worse. Can I see the circumstances where we would want to talk to Russia? Well, that would be part of an international response. And we would certainly, even in this difficult time, we'd always want to be sure that we understood for safety reasons what is happening in place in and around safe, uh, Syria. And actually, one last, last quick question on the, the idea that uh, the Europeans, the EU, once Britain has Brexited, are talking now about pushing on with their own common defence force. Is that something the UK should welcome or oppose? Well, the UK remains a member of the European Union and the UK remains committed to those operations the European Union chooses to conduct. At the moment, many of those have taken maritime flavour around helping to stem the flow of migrants. The circumstances will evolve as the negotiations continue. We will continue to remain a very important part of European security, as I say, playing a leading role in NATO. We do not support the duplication of NATO structures, NATO processes or NATO capabilities. We have been much more interested in a future where we see greater cooperation and greater complementarity between the two European structures. Chief Marshall, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.